As stars stream across a dark blue sky, a fire glows inside a hillside cave. An on-screen graphic, Tonto. As the sky darkens, the firelight dims and goes out. Here, the ancient Solano chose to build their pueblos in a land of deluge and drought. Tall finger-like cacti rise from desert terrain. Every vista even in this arid landscape, is shaped and defined by water. Deeply eroded mountain flanks bear the scars of countless battles with storm clouds. Canyons bite into mesas and snake through mountain highlands. It is the work of water. Currents ripple in a body of water. Boiling clouds and electric air. Much of the desert's rainfall comes with the arrival of summer thunderstorms. Dark clouds roll over a desert valley. Despite these violent intervals, water is a seldom seen visitor to the Tonto Basin. In this arid land, there is an oasis, the Salt River. From its origins in the forested highlands of the White Mountains, the salt cascades into this desert landscape escaping its confinement in the deep Salt River Canyon and emerging into the wide valley of the Tonto Basin. Red cliffs overlook a shallow river. The Tonto Basin is a land in between. In between the Mugion Rim and the Colorado Plateau to the north and the desert lowlands to the south. Tonto National Monument, east of Phoenix. It is both a desert. Yellow wildflowers quiver in a breeze and the forest. Huge cacti stand tall. Ancient saguaro cactus march across the broad flanks of the valley and into the mountains. Higher slopes are covered by juniper and pinyon pine. In the Tonto Basin, plants have evolved to meet the stringent demands of the desert. Widespread roots gather in frequent rainfall. Fast flowering desert plants explode into life after the first rains of spring. White, yellow, and red flowers. And others after the monsoon rains of summer. Purple flowers sway. In time lapse photography, lightning bolts illuminate the night sky above a dark landscape. The saguaro forest provides food and shelter to an amazing variety of animals. A small bird grooms its feathers. Hummingbirds and bees dart from flower to flower while high above, vultures ride the wind. With wings outstretched, a vulture soars in front of a cliff. In the rippling heat of summer, lizards seek protective shade. Other animals retreat into burrows and cavities, waiting for the shade of night. A spider scuttles into a hole ringed with webbing. Scorpions emerge at sunset. Coyotes, owls, and snakes stalk the desert nights. The seldom seen Gila monster is the United States only poisonous lizard. A black and orange lizard creeps across the ground. Elsewhere, a rattlesnake shakes its tail. Even the poisonous venom of a rattlesnake will not deter a roadrunner. The desert is the natural environment for these specially adapted animals. A speckled bird. But not for humans. 
only through knowledge gained from generations of experience, gained from trial and error. Only knowledge enabled humans to survive in this harsh environment. Sometime in the distant past, perhaps 7,000 years ago, the first nomadic hunters and gatherers entered the Tonto Basin. But it wasn't until 700 to 800 AD that people came to stay, the Hohokam. They were a farming people who came from the south, from the desert lowlands of southern Arizona. An insect crawls across a red flower. With mild winters and fertile soils, the Tonto Basin was an ideal place for the Hohokam colonists to settle. They brought with them an in-depth knowledge of agriculture and how to channel water to thirsty garden plots. It may be the contact with the neighboring Mugion people and the Pueblo builders to the north brought in new ideas and changed the way the Hohokam lived. Or it may be that others moved into the region. This chapter of the past still reads like a mystery novel. Archaeologists are not quite sure just who these people were. Light illuminates cliffside ruins. By the year 1200, the people of this desert valley were working in stone, building small Pueblo villages. Their settlements and farmlands lined the Salt River in the Tonto Basin and followed its tributaries upstream. Traces of their intricate canal system were still visible in the early 1900s. The ancient builders were so closely linked to the Salt River, early archaeologists gave them the river's Spanish name, Salado. Their irrigated lands and gardens produced crops of amaranth, a bushy red flower, squash, beans, and most valued of all, corn. In many ways, the desert itself was a garden. The very diet of the Salado included more than 100 varieties of edible plants. And by and large, they were very healthy people and suffered from few dietary diseases. Ghost-like natives work amid the ruins. By midsummer, ojoba beans were edible. Brown pods hang from a plant. The bean-like pods of the mesquite tree were ground into a meal. A man wraps a rock against a grooved stone. Slowly baked in an underground pit, the agave was eaten like a giant artichoke. A painted pot sits beside a spiky agave plant. With the heat of summer, the fruit of the saguaro was ready for harvest and signaled the time for feasting and celebration. A person saws leaves from a grass-like plant. The tough, stringy fibers from yucca leaves were woven into both sleeping mats and fine baskets. Braided into ropes and nets, and made into sandals. The Salado were also hunters. Brightly painted arrows targeted deer and small game. The Tonto Basin has always been a junction, a place where the mountains met the desert and where ancient cultures met as well. It may even be that the Salado were not so much a separate people, but more of a joining of different cultures and ideas. If nothing else, it was distinctive pottery that identified the Salado. From simple pottery, fired to a mottled red-brown, the Salado became skilled artisans. Their pottery evolved over the years and reached its height with the multicolored, complex geometric designs of the Gila and Tonto polychrome styles. Angular bands of red, white, and black paint cover a jug. In fact, Salado-style pottery became the most widely traded and popular pottery in all of ancient Arizona. A painted clay bowl holds cereal grain. Skilled Salado workmanship extended to textiles. Cotton was grown in the Tonto Basin, and may also have been imported from the Hohokam to the south. It was woven into fine cloth. Open weave lace-like cloth was sometimes fashioned into shirts with intricate designs. Possibly symbols of status, they were certainly signs of exceptional craftsmanship. Men were the probable weavers in Salado societies. Trade goods and ideas 
travel over great distances. At Tonto, archaeologists have discovered the remains of macaws. Valued for their colorful plumage, these live parrots were traded northward from the tropics of Central America. Copper bells from Central Mexico, seashells from the coast of California, turquoise from New Mexico, and pottery from the high Mesa country of the Colorado Plateau, all converged on the Salado heartland of the Tonto Basin. The trade network extended for many hundreds of miles. A winding river reflects a rosy sky. In the 1200s and 1300s, large multi-room pueblos appeared at regularly spaced intervals along the Salt River and its tributaries. Animated settlements spring up on the river's banks. Irrigation canals brought water to this thirsty land. But why build in the cliffs? <coughs> Despite the great distances from fields and other villages in the valley below, Tonto's lower cliff dwelling was a desirable place to live. The Alto provided shelter from violent storms and cooling shade during summer's stifling heat. In winter, with the sun lower in the sky, the east-facing exposure warmed quickly on cold mornings and offered protection from winter rains. The rock shelter continued to protect the village for six centuries, long after the Salado left. A rock outcrop that protects crumbling ruins. Archival photographs from the early 1900s revealed that many Pueblo walls withstood the onslaught of time and the elements, mm. only to succumb to vandals and treasure hunters recent past. Frontier people pose among abandoned Pueblos. Yet long ago, the Pueblo was far more imposing than what we see today. In a recreation, ladders lean against steep Pueblo walls. Though there is no direct evidence of warfare, the very nature of construction suggests that the ancient builders were concerned about intruders. Wooden beams support mud and stone walls. In Salado times, the only entrance to the small cliff dwelling was through a V-shaped notch pecked into the native stone and reachable only by ladder. Once removed, the walls were practically unscalable. The village had 16 ground floor rooms and several of the structures reached two stories high. Just outside the protective overhang of the alcove were three additional rooms. The hard native stone was difficult to shape, so the builders relied on mud mortars to bind and to smooth out walls. Floors were leveled and coated with a clay plaster, which can still be seen in the back room. With no beasts of burden, construction materials were brought in on the backs of human porters. Distant juniper and pine forests provided the wood for the ceiling beams. Smaller poles and saguaro ribs completed the ceiling latticework, which was then covered with clay. Rooms were used for both sleeping and storage of food and supplies. Clay-lined hearths provided warmth on cold winter evenings, and low doorways prevented heat from escaping. The fire-blackened walls and ceilings are a telltale record from years of smoldering fires. A layer of black soot stains a Pueblo's interior. Several families lived in the rock shelter, each family occupying a room or two. The village population may have totaled 40 people or more. <laughs> to the south, the largest archaeological site of Tonto overlooks nearby Cave Canyon. <coughs> The 40-room Pueblo crowds into the alcove of the upper cliff dwelling and was home to about 100 salado. The village nestled in a cliff face, perched over 600 feet above Cave Canyon and 1,500 feet above the Salt River. But the upper cliff dwelling did have one real advantage. Just below the entrance, a spring provided one of the few reliable sources of water on the normally parched hillsides. Today, 
the spring still supports life. A deer walks up a slope with yellow brush. At times, a small seat in the back of the alcove would also flow, and the villagers built a catchment basin to contain the precious water. The back of the rock shelter may have been an open, unwalled area. The steep, sloping floor required the Salado to build rooms that stair-stepped downward. From a distance, the settlement appeared as if it were a city of stone towers. Atop a grassy hill, light brown Pueblo walls are nestled against a cliff. Of the 32 rooms on the ground level, the very largest were toward the back of the rock shelter. Eight second-story rooms completed the settlement. Some of the original ceilings remain intact. The upper cliff dwelling had a commanding view of much of the eastern Tondo Basin. Several holes in the walls appear to be viewing portals, window-like openings. Evidence suggests that villages were linked by some form of signal communication, perhaps to warn against danger. Virtually all settlements in the region were visible to at least one other village. Were the cliff dwellings built as defensive bastions? Probably not at first, but in the 1300s, life began to change for the only peaceful Salado. Up to this time, the Salado lived in small, isolated farming settlements. One theory suggests that fear the threat of violence may have been the catalyst that pushed the Salado to move into ever larger villages in the Tonto Basin and into these cliff dwellings. After the year 1400, the Salado culture began to gradually disintegrate. The exact reasons for the collapse remain a mystery. Perhaps the Salado were driven away there is evidence that several of the settlements in the Tongo Basin were burned to the ground. A campfire burns on a dark plain. The Salado may have been pushed away by drought and a changing climate, or pulled away by the promise of a better life in well-watered lands elsewhere. Alarm. That's a pretty river there. Oh. That's a pretty river there. The river is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Yeah, I take lots of pictures. There's a lot of pictures. This is this room over here behind the iron railing. It's the only fully intact roof and room that we have, and so that's one of the reasons why you can't go in there. Um, um, the two old rooms. But anyway. <laughs>
The white stuff is out, please, though. It's crazy to think hundreds and hundreds of years ago those were people's hands. Yeah, like how. Look how small it is compared to. I'm not just as pretty. <laughs> Shut up. Thousands of years old. They're really idiots. <laughs> 